The year is 1992. The first book in the series Goosebumps hits the shelves, almost immediately garnering critical acclaim. The series began selling millions of copies a month, encouraging a TV show to be made, getting the number one spot in the US for kids TV for years. R.L. Stein's Goosebumps becomes a piece of pop culture forever. I'm Matt Braxton, a longtime fan of the series, and this is my Goosebumps retrospective. Uh, really quick, I'm thinking about making a Goosebumps book club series where uh, every other week I make a video talking about one of the Goosebumps books uh, in order. And you guys, if you want to, can read the same book in between each video. And then when you watch the video, it's like, uh, like a book club. <sighs> I know I'm a nerd. But yeah, so if you guys would be interested, make sure to leave a like and a comment below and I'll, I'll make it happen. Also, make sure you hit the sub button so you're notified of it. All right, thank you. Back to the video. Around the second grade, my mom found two books in a bin of her teaching materials, Vampire Breath and It Came From Beneath a Sink. Great books with all right episodes of the show, but upon reading them, I immediately fell in love. I wanted more. So I went to my second grade teacher and tried to check one out from her classroom library, Night of the Living Dummy. She told me it was too far under my reading level and I should read something more challenging, but she missed the point. A strong reader doesn't require a challenge. A strong reader wants something of interest. So obviously, I talked to my mom, a reading teacher, and you better believe I checked out that damn book from the classroom library the very next day. Thank you, Mom. If I thought the first two books I read were good, Night of the Living Dummy was amazing. So naturally, I uh, ended up with all of these. There's more. While my exposure to the Goosebumps book and TV series was around 15 to 20 years after the initial hype, actually close to the releases of the Goosebumps Horrorland series, which is a whole video in and of itself, like the Enter Horrorland game that was advertised in the back of each book and was dropped by Scholastic quickly after, bring that game back, that was awesome! But anyways, as I was saying, my exposure to Goosebumps was well after its creation, and I was surprised to see just how mainstream the property used to be. According to the very reputable source Wikipedia, upon the release of the first book, Welcome to Dead House, Goosebumps received critical acclaim with many critics and readers praising the series for its dark nature, villains, and for being much more mature compared to other children's book series at the time. Two reviewers of the Goosebumps books did not feel that the books were high quality literature. US News and World Report's Mark Silver thought the series was quite tame. He called the Goosebumps books sub-literature, stating the plotting in the books was careless and that characters in the stories rarely grew. Roderick McGillis from the academic journal Bookbird described the books as camp, writing the books are so artificial, so formulaic, so predictable, so repetitive. McGillis also felt the content of the Goosebumps series is thin in the extreme. Obviously, the second reviewers didn't understand they were children's books. I bet the same people went on to praise Berenstein Bears for being formulaic or some crap. But yes, while many of the Goosebumps books were cliche and predictable, they still had a reputation for getting children excited about reading, which the writer is very proud of. James Carter, writing in Talking Books, children's authors talk about the craft, creativity, and process of writing, stated, Regarding point horrors and goosebumps, I feel that anything that children read avidly is a good thing. Librarian and writer Patrick Jones commented that the real horror is a culture where kids, especially boys, don't read, and Stein has done his best to stop that turn of the screw from happening in his lifetime. Funny enough, goosebumps books were popular and apparently scary enough for parents to try to ban them in schools. In fact, they were so popular that in 1996, Goosebumps accounted for 15% of Scholastic's revenue. This meant, what else, they had to cash in a bit. The Goosebumps show, which you'd have to pretty much be living under a rock to not have heard of, at least, was one of those attempts, and one of the most successful, arguably. The show aired for four seasons spanning just over three years. There were many strong episodes, like Night of the Living Dummy 2 and 3, which why they never made the first one is a whole other video topic, but there were also weaker entries like Chilogy and An Old Story. Ugh. I have so much nostalgia for the series, but I will be honest in saying the small budget shows, and it does not always hold up well. That being said, I definitely have my favorites. 
Now, quickly, I have not rewatched every one of these, so they might not hold up as well as I remember, but here they are anyway. Obviously, One Day at Horror Land, even if it was really campy at times, The Living Dummy Ones, as I said, and Attack of the Jack-O-Lanterns, to name a few. During the run of the show, Disney actually hosted a Goosebumps attraction at the park. Yeah, the happiest place on Earth, one of the hostess series where one of the main villains is a ventriloquist dummy who threatened to cut a kid's head off with hedge trimmers. Granted, that book came out way after, but still. The Fright Show starred Slappy and a variety of other characters trying to hold the audience hostage. It's not great, but it's all Disney attraction fun. There is also a fun house, and according to LaughingPlace.com, originally the maze was more of a traditional house of mirrors that was relatively simple to make your way through, but due to popular demand, the fun house was updated to add some difficulty as well as characters from the show as you made your way through. Too bad declining book sales led to the demise of the Disney show and attraction as well as the TV show. But hey, that didn't stop R.L. Stein. There were plenty of Goosebumps book series to come after the main series, like Goosebumps Series 2000, the cancelled Goosebumps Gold series, Goosebumps Horrorland, which was the great series I mentioned before, Hall of Horrors, Most Wanted, and now Slappy World, which is the only series I have not at least read one book from. There were also Choose Your Own Adventure, comics, and more, but I never really found those quite as interesting. And who could forget the plethora of board games, video games, merchandise, fan club stuff, and more. But then, the year 2015 rolls around, and this movie comes out. It was... pretty good? Not great, but there were plenty of worse movies coming out around that time. The sequel was far worse, and... Oh god, I hope the TV show they're developing for Disney Plus is better. Please, please, please. The original book series really deserves a good modern adaptation. So yeah, I guess that was my brief retrospective on the Goosebumps franchise. There is far more to go in-depth about, like the mini video games made, as well as a ton of other stuff only diehard fans know about. But as I said... I was born well after the series' massive popularity, unfortunately, so my retrospective can only really be retrospective for what I was alive to be retrospective about. So yeah, please consider subscribing as this is definitely not my last Goosebumps related video. I've already done a Goosebumps video game review and plan to do more. And I also really want to try out that book club TV show idea, so please make sure to tune in for that. And also feel free to comment your favorite Goosebumps book or TV episode. I'm Matthew Braxton. Thanks for watching.